Thanks, Richard. I'm Heather. Hello. So, um, for the three curators of Pair of uh, Jules de Jeux, this project started last November when the Gaete gave us a call and invited us to put together a show of playable experiences and games as a preeminent form of digital culture, um, slated to open uh, in June 2012. So this was November of last year. And before that point, Oscar had been working behind the scenes. He was instrumental in getting the show created and launched inside of the Gaete, and he'll talk more about the Gaete later. So our goal was to fill the exhibition space of the Gaete Lyrique with uh, these pieces, as well as events and workshops and other things going on. And we chose some existing projects, which we'll show you. And we also commissioned uh, quite a few new works that were built specifically to various uh, spaces and rooms inside the Gaete. And our goals were to have some digital games and non-digital, some that are low tech and some that are quite high tech. Some that are, are simple, maybe even one button, and others that are quite sophisticated. And uh, to have a mix of individual play and social play in the spaces. So it's a quite a varied show. And this is some footage of the, the show on the opening night. <laughs> Thanks. And uh, most of the, the photos and videos are by a, a guy named Emmerich, who did a great job at the Gaiete. Um, so, we took as an inspiration and starting point the building of the Gaete itself and its capacities. And as you can see here, it already looks and feels quite a lot like a gameable space. Um, but some of the things you can't really see in this image that are important about it are the, the capacities it has. It's a very new building. It was only built within like the last two years. And some things that it has is throughout the building, all the lights are individually programmable all the speakers like throughout the ceiling of the building could also be individually addressed and uh, interactively programmed. There's a series of LED strips along the floor and also movable LED signs that could be hung anywhere which are also programmable interactively or just to play different uh, pre-recorded pieces. It's uh, completely uh, full of RFID sensors and very importantly, there's fiber optic throughout the entire building interior so that all these things can be talking to each other and to central servers. And also really important uh, that people don't think about much is that the, the infrastructure for mounting different kinds of technology like projectors uh, and screens is there. They have a very solid bars on the ceiling that you can hang anything off of and cages that support and hold all the computers and the wiring and lots of power outlets even on the ceiling. Uh, and the, the architecture of the building is a bit labyrinthine. You can see that here in, the, in this cutaway, which is only, only showing you one side, and the other side is different and equally labyrinthine. Um, but it definitely inspires a game-like feeling, and we really wanted to, to work with that. Some of the spaces in this image that are uh, an exhibition spaces that we are going to talk a lot about, but also this concert hall that you see, the large box, an auditorium, uh, a library that's a resource center of all kinds of, of books and other kinds of works. Uh, internet access throughout the building, some cafe bars that you could hang out in, and workshop spaces, and even a dedicated video game space, which you'll see more about later. So, in putting together a show that's about this building, we wanted a piece that would run throughout the Gaete and really unify it as a playable building. So we commissioned Hide and Seek, a group from London. I think Alex is here. Woot! Woo! <laughs> Uh, so their Hide and Seek are, are really well known for their own festival of pervasive and street games and they also do other kinds of digital games and in fact have done games in the past that were very site specific and so we wanted to see how they would take that knowledge of site specific physical play and, and make it responsive to this location, this very specific building. And so this, uh, what we see here is the entrance fo foyer that uh, shows the, the very first thing you see of their piece, the building is. And uh, the premise of that game is that the Gaete itself is sentient and it has moods. And if you're a visitor to the exhibition, you can interact with the building through its various senses and you can affect its mood. Uh, so there's four big sculptural architectural games in the galleries that I'll show you briefly. And then uh, there's a way that the game can actually show you how it's feeling. So uh, you get a scorecard when you come in. It's in your, uh, your gallery guide. And it helps you keep track of, of what the building thinks of you. So uh, if you are going to one of the games, you can mark down what the game responds to you on this, cord, this card and keep it. 
And you can also uh, see what the building is, uh, the mood of the building through the various displays that I was mentioning, like the LED strips on the floor, that's what you see along the bottom here, but also there were screens throughout in like the high traffic areas. So this is the building listens. It's actually a game you can start to play before you even enter the building. You can call a, a number from your cell phone and leave a message for the building to tell, give, it, give a response to a mood that it currently has. And this number was printed not only around the building, but also throughout Paris in the metro posters, like in the subway, you'd see the number there too. This piece is The Building Feels. It's a two-player game, kind of like Simon, where uh, it's built into the walls of a tiny room. In fact, this is a little video, a very short video. So it's like a call and response. You follow a melody of the buttons as they light up around the wall, and you and your, your player partner need to uh, figure out how to solve the, the room itself. This piece is the building smells. Uh, you'll see there's an orange ping pong ball. You have to take the ping pong ball and impregnate it with your scent, like rub it in your armpit or something like that. And then you and, and another player who's, who's uh, manning the, the hand pump that we see the fellow holding here are uh, co cooperating to try to get the ball through one of these three different courses that are uh, sculpted into one of those holes, which is the, the building's nostrils, you can see on the far end. This piece is the building sees. Oh, yes, there is a video. You are right. Thanks. So the, the building needs your help to see around corners. So in this room, it's a, a two-player game, and you have, you're holding, each player's holding a mirror, and you're trying to bounce a small spotlight that appears somewhere in the room, uh, and sometimes there's two of them, and you're trying to point the, the light at a camera, which is the, the build, building's way of, of seeing. So, and then if you successfully hold the light there, then you'll get a, a trickier challenge and, and work your way up. Hmm. And so finally, after you've uh, shown, how the, the, shown the building, uh, like how you feel through all these different uh, sense games, you get to the building decides. And this is the, the last piece in both uh, the show for most visitors and uh, in the building is. And it's based on this, those symbols that you collected from the Four Sense games, you, you can fill out your sort of final uh, mood card and it will interpret those, it being the gaite, will interpret those and give you a role and it gives you a certificate that represents that role. And some of the examples of the roles, which were all very humorous and lighthearted and, and crazy, uh, were tender architect or extreme bureaucrat. And so that's what the building thinks that it, you can do for it best. And if you're really lucky, the building sometimes needs help from its visitors. And your role, like tender architect, might be required by the building. And it will announce that it's the, what the building needs is called out over the PA system and it's visible on the screens throughout the building. And if you uh, hear that and you are first to respond, you can make your way back into the, the secret back room of the gaieté uh, behind locked doors and you'll find the building's heart. And that's what we see here. This is the building's heart. Uh, and if you're brave enough to touch the heart, then you can reach inside it and pluck its heartstrings and palpitate it. And uh, doing so will change the building's mood. So when you go back outside to the rest of the gaieté, you'll see on all these screens that you've been seeing all along the building's mood. Now you've changed and affected the building's mood. So this piece is a uh, 30 pas ante terre ciel, and uh, Oscar and I created this one together. Uh, there's a very long uh, balcony space at the Gaieté, and we wanted something there that would really showcase the idea of play along or play together. So uh, we took this, a game that's normally multiplayer, but uh, one at a time, and made it a two-player game. So it's a hopscotch. And uh, it's very long, it's 29 meters long, so it asks the two players to interact with each other in different ways, and there's some pausing points where you can figure out what you, what you need to do next. And some of the things you might have to do are like hold hands or alternate one and the other when you do your jumps. And it also has some moments where you interact verbally, such as encouraging the other players on the morel. And since as it's, as it's quite long, there's often like four or five other pairs that are jumping along.
This piece is the elephant in the room, and one of the special spaces at the Gaete is called the Chambre Sonore, and it's an, a programmable light, sound, and pressure environment in this tiny kind of padded cell-like room. And uh, Damien Defiti, who's a programmer and musician that many of you probably know, um, created this piece that uh, is a puzzle game. It, it requires you to pay really close attention to the effects of the different pressure pads and to solve puzzles that, that sort of change the color. And as you solve one, it will move on to a, a more challenging puzzle. And you can play it by yourself or, as you see here, with, with other players. And now I pass it on to... Lynn. So my name is Lynn. I, I'm less known at Indicate, so I'll just say that I've come to games uh, from the media arts. And uh, I think in the introductory video, you saw uh, a little, there was a little glimpse of Propinquity, which is a sensor based full body game that I'm working on at the moment with Bart Simon in Montreal. So I'm just going to take up where Heather left off and talk some more about the giant games, which is what we call these very big commissions. Um, <clears throat> the thing about them, and I think you will have already got a sense of that from Heather's uh, description, is that they really were big, complex projects. They were complicated in every way you could possibly imagine. <laughs> so uh, time, budget, space, interaction with the Gaete, interaction with uh, the city. <laughs> Everything you can, you can think of. Uh, and uh, they were, of course, m mostly complicated. They were complicated for us, but, but very much so for the artists. And we all had uh, four or five months to get the whole thing up and working, and then it had to work for two months. So I think we're still thinking, in retrospect, that it was a miracle that it all worked out, which I think it did. Uh, so uh, I'll just talk very briefly about interference, because you've seen quite a bit of it here at Indiecade. Um, so um, th here's a, a picture of it in, in, in the installation setting just before it opened. Um, and uh, this is just an opportunity to, to make sure that you see an overview of it, if you haven't already seen an overview of it. Uh, without the, it doesn't have the tokens in it, the pieces in it. Um, but also it, it's to show, to, to, to just say that it was in a very particular space. I mean, all of the spaces for these pieces were quite specific particular spaces. But this was a public space between the main bar and the main concert hall. So it had all kinds of restrictions, but it was also like a really important space to fill with something. Uh, and it was also a free space. People didn't have to pay to come there. So I'm just going to do a little tiny bit of the video. I think most of you know, maybe we can turn the sound down just a little bit. So I think most of you know that it's a chaotic, uh, very social strategy game in which you and a partner compete to try to dominate a colony of cells around a central cell. And that the twist is that in order to fill up with your color, your cells, you have to take them from uh, people's active games alongside you. That's probably enough, I think. Just Okay, and uh, the next one is uh, Electricity Comes from Other Planets. Uh, this is Fred Deacon and company. Uh, Fred uh, is a London-based designer. He, for, for the last 15 years, he was part of, he is one of the founders of the graphic design and interaction design firm Airside, which is a very big, well, no, was a small, well-known <laughs> firm in uh, London. And that's now closed, because I think they all want to do other things. Uh, and he's also known for, uh, as a musician, and he was uh, founder of the group Lemon Jelly, if any of you know that. Okay. So I'm going to let him and Heather speak for, them, for, for themselves. There's so much of a link between the playfulness of games and that of music. So Electricity Comes From Other Planets, for me, is something that really uh, ties this together the most closely, because the playfulness of your body and moving in it is what creates the musical patterns and allows people that are playing together uh, to collaborate to make, basically to mix their own music physically, but through discovery. These planets are, are generating uh, power. If you don't interact with them, they're in a sleep state. As soon as you start playing with them, they start giving back to you. They start flashing along with the music. You can play them individually and they work like that. You can just explore what the, the piano sounds like or the strings sound like. Or you can play the drums or the bass together. You can start combining a couple of elements. And when you do that, the, the piece gives you more visuals. Triggering music in a real world space in a new way, in an interactive way, was something we really wanted to play with. Prince started coming. And 
the next one is Kit Operette. Uh, this is done by Daily Tous Les Jours. Uh, they're a very small but very well-known um, company in Montreal that does uh, public ludic installations, usually large-scale installations. And again, I'll just play through a little video of part of the actual piece. be a little bit hard to understand but basically uh, the public co come in participants come in and take on the roles depending on what uh, parts of the environment are available to to play with which is indicated by the lights so es especially in terms of these last two uh, they're really sort of media art arty design things and what are they doing in a, in a show about games um, so you know I think it was really important to us to have a continuum from these kinds of things, very large-scale interactive environments with very ludic qualities, to the other end, which is uh, sophisticated, long-form screen games that are, are innovative and interesting. And of course, everything in between, and a lot of the, the good stuff is in between. Um, so, you know, just from my point of view, interactive works of art and design imply a design relationship uh, between a closed authorial space uh, and a more open participative improvisational space, so between constraints and rules and play. Um, and, you know, the more I th I've thought about it, the more I, I focus on the fact that games have always, this, th this defines games. So and here I don't mean digital games, I mean any game. So there's a sense in which games have come into their own in this very full way in, in the digital age because uh, interactive uh, forms of any sort have that shape. They have the shape of a game. So to me, there is this underlying sense in which games are really uh, the key form <laughs> of, of uh, interactive culture. So I'll pass it on to Cindy now. I think that's the last one. So far, we've looked mostly at works that we commissioned um, for the space. We did commission a large number of works because we wanted to integrate with the space so much. And to be honest, there's just not many games for 100, 100 foot projection walls that we have that we could choose from and select for the show. But I also want to, um, to point out that there are a number of, um, uh, that we put as much work into uh, the relationship between space and pre-existing games and works that, uh, that we brought in as well. So I'm gonna talk about a few of these. Now I just wanna have a little bit of a caveat before I start talking. Um, there are a lot of works in each of these sections, and I'm not going to be able to mention them all without running out of my time. Um, but if you're interested in the specific games that went into specific spaces, then there's lots of documentation for the show online, and you can go and find different ones. I'll, I'll shout out a couple of ones in relationship to specific things, but um, I unfortunately can't name them all. Um, so uh, one of these spaces, I would say, is sort of a, a, um, a designed space around a certain type of game is the, um, is the new arcade space. Now, the, the games that we showed in the new arcade space were specifically tied to a certain format of game that um, works really well in um, environments where you may have them in conjunction with loud electronic music um, that are projected on kind of large screens and that tend to have a lot of kind of people within the space and have a, a social aspect to them. And Heather and I are very familiar with this format because of work that we've done putting on the Gamma events um, with Kokoromi. Uh, this wasn't, you know, this was 
not a gamma event per se. Uh, none of these games were created for this environment, but uh, a lot of care went into picking games that essentially picked up the things that work in that kind of space. So um, they're out of the works that were um, in the new arcade section, uh, none of them rely on sound, so we could have that DJ music kind of in, involved in the environment. Um, they have different sorts of player relations in them. So there's one game there, I mean, the, uh, one of the games is Ibn Ab, which we brought in there. Um, and it has, um, I'll play a couple of these. Oops. Oh, that's not right. Oh, you and your backwards keys, Oscar. Um, sorry. Yeah, but it's, there's volume. Um, so, um, uh, some of the games, uh, Ibn, Ibn Ab was one of the games, it's a two-player game that you need to play with two players. Um, this is a game called Flex that is a, a collaboration between um, Sandra Vendere, who's a, um, uh, a, game, uh, a game designer, and um, on uh, uh, um, that's, I'm totally butchering that, by the way, a uh, famous uh, multimedia artist who's best known for interactive animation work. And, um, and as you can kind of see from sort of both of these, um, of these, these videos in here, um, you get, they're games that almost force you to kind of talk to the people who are also playing the games. Uh, another kind of key aspect of them is that the games are, um, tend to be very short and pick up and play. So you can go there and you can play them and people can only play them for two minutes, three minutes and hand them off to somebody else who's playing there. Um, they're games where you can kind of start playing them and if somebody comes along you can say, oh, we need a fourth person and drag that person in and they can play the game as well. And then obviously, as you can, kind of, as you can see from, um, you know, from the games that are in that section, they have a, vis a visual spectacle quality to them as well. They look really great when they're projected in a, um, in, a large, in a large space and they have a huge visual impact. So that's one kind of sort of tailored space around a certain kind of format of, uh, format of game that we were working with. Um, this is the peak space, and it is a very different space for a very different sort of game. Uh, we wanted to use this space to show works that were more, um, uh, that we were uh, very fully developed games that are almost auteur games by, um, uh, by the creators who have put them together. So uh, in this space, we had games at a number of different stages of development, from a really early version of uh, Jonathan Blows the Witness uh, to uh, what at the time was a pre-release game um, by, uh, by Minority um, called, uh, called Papa Yo. Um, Unfinished Swan was there in spirit in a way. It was unfortunately, uh, unfortunately it was pulled from the show just before the show started and so we had to show documentation of it. But you know, that's how fresh they were. Um, that you know, they could have happened or could have not happened. And um, yeah, and, uh, and Fez was the other one in that game. So from those games, I mean, those are games that you don't want to spend two minutes with. Um, you actually want to have a more a quieter, kind of more contemplative space to, uh, to to play them and to spend some time with them, and um, which is kind of, which is what we were trying to to um, to, to craft within this as well. Um, they also, all of those games uh, had an interesting relationship to space and architecture, so they fed back into the overall theme of the show. Um, yeah, that's about yeah, I'm actually not going to play the video. So um, along with those, um, uh, with those spaces which we put together, uh, we also had two sub-curated spaces. And this is where we, we essentially invited people who we thought had interesting things to say about games um, and could work with spaces and, uh, and kind of gave them you know, sections of the show that they could, that they could work with. Um, one of these great um, uh, projects was Meowton, which is a, um, uh, we put together by Baby Castles, which many people are familiar with. They're a uh, New York-based uh, arcade collective. They put on arcade shows in New York and also have done a lot of work recently, um, both in museums and creating installation pieces that uh, play into like a really kind of lo-fi, punk, hacky type of approach to playing with just all sorts of different kind of games. So their theme for um, their space was to create a city uh, for cats. So Meowton is a city that is built by cats for cats. It's got a number of different spaces, some of which are you know, of, different, of different kinds of sizes. This is the Meowma, by the way. This is the museum in Meowton. Um, the, all of the games in Meowton are cat-themed games, and they all use, um, uh, so this is one of the, uh, this is the jail in, uh, uh, in, in Meowton. Um, but the games have, um, play this video really quick. Where 
Where the hell? Not my computer. Um, so, uh, I, it, so this, um, so this whole thing was put together, uh, and with, um, uh, Chi Tran, who's a, uh, I guess alternative sculptor, I would call it, but again, uh, very lo-fi, uh, rapid fabrication type stuff, so all of these spaces were, were, uh, were put together. Um, they have all of these custom controllers built in, so for example, in the Persh, the first, um, you know, uh, thing right there, uh, you play the game using the, uh, the steering wheel. It's like a hack steering wheel controller. Um, this right here is the town hall, and inside you find the game The Cat and the Coup, which I, some of you might be familiar with. Uh, yeah. uh, but you play that game. First of all, you have to crawl into it, as you saw. Um, and then you play the game on all fours on a dance mat where you can kind of control, where you need, you can need the pads to kind of navigate through the game. And then you, there is a hanging cat toy that you flick to um, kind of select things um, within the game as well. So it's kind of modeled after the play of cats and addressing kind of cat-themed games at the same time. Um, their vision for it was to kind of, was to create a space that was like an arcade, uh, like an arcade cabinet that was built into an entire room. Uh, the second um, sub-curated space that we had was um, the patroller is present, which was a sort of a preview to what was then um, pre-release for um, Brandon Boyer's new online magazine, uh, which is Venus Patrol. So what uh, Brandon uh, was invited to come into the Especia video, which Oscar is going to talk about, um, the kind of dedicated video game, um, video game space. And essentially what it is, is it's um, embodying the spirit of what's a virtual space, this online magazine, and bringing it in to show this, the spirit of the games and the works that were going to be part of, um, uh, of Venus Patrol. Uh, with that, I'm going to hand things over to Oscar, who can tell you more about the Espacio Studio and the Gaiety in general. Okay. So the idea is, where did that happen? <laughs> that, that's the kind of question I'm going to answer, right? So it happened in Paris, in that place, which is called La Gaiety Lyrique, that building there, which was built in 1862 to be the, like the, Place for operette, which is a smaller form of opera. It's kind of a old way of doing musicals, uh, and it was only it was reopened. It was closed in the in the eighties and reopened uh, a year and a half ago to host a culture center, which is about digital cultures in general, right? How they transform our society. So it's not technologically obsessed, right? We don't show technology for the sake of technology. We try to see how in art and in culture in general, they transform us, right? So this is the front of the building, and once you get in, <clears throat> you get to see those big thematic exhibitions that run throughout the year. Uh, so most of them are like three months. Uh, Jules Le Jeu was one of them. And they take, out, they take up the whole building, right? So, there's going to be exhibitions, there's going to be concerts, there's going to be all kind of programmation in there that, are, that, that fit that specific thematic thing that's happening. So here's a little selection of things that are going to happen uh, in 2012 and 2013. Uh, on the 11th of October, so uh, I'm flying back Tuesday morning for the opening of that, <laughs> and I'm working the whole day. Uh, H5 is a show about... Um, a brand that was actually created. So there's the guys. There are the guy that did a short called Logorama that built that won an Oscar uh, two years ago, and they're doing a thing. They're inventing a fake brand, right? And they're making a whole museum about that brand as if it was a privatized complex about that. Like if there was, if the Gate had been their offices all along for 200 years, and they're gonna show you everything, how they do marketing, how they sell their shit how they give you goodies about the brand and so on, except it's a fake brand, and it, show, it kind of shows you going through the exhibition how scary that is. So after that, we have Monsters in Fashion. We have Captain Future, which is uh, a thing about giving uh, artists and elect like electro musicians uh, the task to do the same thing they do, except for kids, right? So we're going to have concerts for kids, exhibitions for kids, etc that are made by artists that don't work with kids most often. Uh, 
sound system is the, the thing that's going to take Schulisch's place next summer. It's going to happen for three months in the summer. It's uh, an exhibition and thematic exploration of moving sound, right? So how sound moves about and how it's been invented uh, in Jamaica, the boom boxes and how now it happens. And the Happy Show is our fall exhibition. It is a show that already exists. You might have seen it in uh, New York, if my memory is correct. And it's a show about what happiness is, right? So this is the kind of thematic themes that inhabit that building. And Jules Lejeu was one of them, right? So it means that the whole building is taken by it. Now, when a theme like that is present, it, it exists in exhibitions, it exists in concerts, and of course in events, right? And we do all, kind of event, all kinds of events, and I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about uh, a few of the events of Jules Lejeu, right? So, of our exhibition. Uh, many of you have know that game or have played it? It's JS Joust by Die Gute Fabrik. Indeed, indeed, bravo. It is a, an awesome game. If you haven't played it, I recommend you do. You look it up on the interwebs to see where it's happening. Um, this is uh, another evening, uh, a soiree. And this is an event that we did with uh, Brandon Boyer. Uh, it is a talk by Keda Takahashi, well known for Katamari Damacy and for Nobi Nobi Boy. Um, and what he did is he talked and drew at the same time, right? So imagine me, who's already having a hard time talking to you, drawing at the same time and explaining to you that I like doing, uh, I would like to do a giraffe lamp or a 20 meters uh, uh, hopscotch or something like that. And uh, so he did that. And after that, the whole public, right? So the whole audience and him, 100 people came out in the street, went out in the street and drew with chalk all together. And so it was... We had lots of friends coming here. You might know a few of them. And uh, that's the kind of events we do. And another thing that was mentioned before, and that is there at the Gaete Lyrique, but it's not the whole building, right? It's just one of the spaces, is the Espace uh, Jeux Vidéo. And the Espace Jeux Vidéo, just in case you don't know, uh, is uh, the place where video games happen all year long, right? So from, f it, it ranges, from all ages of players, it is free, it opens every day, and it shows you people that is uh, a game that you might have heard of. Uh, it shows to all those people that, is, that games are not Call of Battle of Modern Warfare or StarCraft shit. It's just, it is, that they exist and they are part of the gaming culture, so they are here sometimes in programmations, but most of the time it is uh, it's going to be Braid, it's going to be Limbo, games that you are most, most of you are very familiar with, except people don't know about them, right? So we take them through it, and we do that through a lot of different, uh, a lot of different workshops and a lot of different uh, events that we do at the Espacio Video. Uh, yeah, this photo is pretty cool, except it's weird because it's uh, this eight-year-old kid uh, raped Limbo from like beginning to end in two hours straight without like dying, he died 10 times. So that's super weird and he never played it before. So, and that's his dad uh, watching him get uh, crushed by a spider. So yeah, we have all ages coming along because most of the time kids that come in the Espacio video, they're gonna go, it's not the video games I used to, I'm used to, so the parents can't really leave them there, right? They, they, they stay with them and so we have all ages playing together. And so if you ever happen to make games, and uh, it has been said to me that some of you do, uh, you take a photo or you write that down. This is the, it is an address of a uh, mailbox that will get you featured in there. And so if you want to publish it, make it available to your other indie friends, uh, you send your games to that address and it will get showcased in there. Even if it's a, an early build of the game and if you'd like feedback from players that are not the ones that you usually deal with. Uh, we have most often when you, we have a build, an early build of a game, we have a little uh, notebook on the side in which people can make comments about uh, what the game was. So with that, I'm going to 
go to question, except I'm going to answer a question that I asked myself earlier. <laughs> uh, yes, I'm like that. <laughs> Ask them. And uh, so was the show successful, right? Was the show a success? So for us, the Gaîté Lyrique, first of all, it was very, very well uh, you know, received by people. A lot of people came in. And this is a lady called Heather Kelly. She was standing there, but she's also standing there. And in front of a, th a thing that says, the show is full. And that happened. And uh, that happened not once, but many times, in fact. And so, not only that, but the press, like one of the most listened to radio, at one of the most listened to hour, said, opened their uh, cultural, uh, you know, cultural column by saying, Jules Le Jeu, this show is awesome. And like that was the opening. That's how I woke up at eight in the morning one day. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> so it was very well received by the public, by the press. And with that, uh, we're gonna go to questions. Thank you.